Nature's Archive Podcast, a Jumpstart Nature production. Hey everyone, as you probably know, my new organization, Jumpstart Nature, just released a short pilot season of the Jumpstart Nature podcast. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, well, you're in luck because I'm sharing two of the episodes here today. So before we dive into that, bear with me for just a minute so I can tell you a little bit about it. The Jumpstart Nature podcast is a little bit different than Nature's Archive. Well, a lot different. Yes, we do focus on a nature topic every episode, but we bring in multiple perspectives and we put it all together in an engaging and entertaining narrative. The voice of Jumpstart Nature is Griff Griffith, who you've heard on this podcast, and he brings his unique style to tell the stories. Episodes average around 25 minutes, so they're much shorter than Nature's Archive, but they're packed full of great information. We make every episode relevant to you, our listeners, and we aim to inspire you to action every time. Our first season covered rethinking your lawn, impacts of feeding birds, how shifting baseline syndrome skews our perspective of nature, and the importance of landscape, scale, wildlife connectivity. But those bullet points don't do it justice. Every episode has a few surprises in store. We hope this podcast can reach beyond the choir and show regular people what they can do. But we also hope it will serve as a reinforcer for those who are already very nature aware. In fact, my favorite bit of feedback we got from the pilot season was from a biologist who thanked us for, and I'm quoting, helping show her the way to effectively communicate these challenging topics. There are just so many great topics we can cover in the Jumpstart Nature format, and we're already working on the next season, so be sure to subscribe to the Jumpstart Nature podcast on whatever app you use. And as for the episode shared today, the first one is called The Yard of the Future, and it runs 27 minutes. And the second one is called We Live in a 10% World, and it runs for 26 minutes. So please let me know what you think. I look forward to your feedback. And by the way, Nature's Archive interview episodes return in two weeks. So without further delay, this peek into the Jumpstart Nature podcast. If you are listening right now, you probably already appreciate the awesomeness that is plants. I mean, besides cyanobacteria and algae, they're the only living things that can convert sunlight into energy. And no plants means no pollinators, no birds, no mammals, and yes, no people. Plants fulfill the godlike role of supporting most life as we know it. Despite their divine efforts, however, most of us only like them for their looks, like their flowers or beautiful green landscapes, or maybe even for their creature comforts that they provide us, like cool shade or soft comfort of a lawn. In fact, we focus a lot on creating beautiful landscapes with beautiful plants. But very often, it's to the detriment of the critical functions that only plants can provide. It ties in with the perception that you have that that plants are decorations. You don't want anything to touch your decoration or it won't be perfect, but that's not real life. Jumpstart Nature is on a mission to support life, lots of it, because that's what keeps our ecosystems robust, our crops thriving, our wildlife flourishing, and that's what's going to help our descendants thrive too. But we've somehow inherited a curious tradition that traces back to colonial England where our lands are valued for their decorative aesthetics rather than their functionality. Landscaping your yard was like a way of showing that you colonized the patch of wild that you had dominion over. And this choice we've collectively made has far-reaching impacts that are hard to fully understand. So let's connect the dots between the history and our relationship with plants in our yards, and together we'll uncover the yard of the future. This is Jumpstart Nature. Just to set the stage, there are over 44 million acres of lawn in the United States. That sounds like a big number, but is it? It's an area bigger than the size of New England, and it's dedicated to a status symbol, which happens to be an ecological dead zone, so we can do better. That's more area than used to grow corn. In fact, one estimate concluded lawn occupies more space in the United States than all eight of our largest irrigated crops combined. By the way, that voice you heard a moment ago was Dr. Doug Ptolemy. Dr. Ptolemy is an entomologist and ecologist, co-founder of Homegrown National Park, and is perhaps best known for his research about and advocacy for native plants. 
Maybe Dr. Ptolemy's description of lawns as ecological dead zones sounds a bit extreme. So let's explore this more deeply. Remember a moment ago when I was talking about how critical plants are for supporting life? It's easy to overlook the magic of photosynthesis, and yes, even lawns partake in this process. But how does the energy that plants create transfer to animals? It turns out that native plants pass the food on to animals much better than non-native plants, because the animals they're passing the food on are adapted to eating them. Plants protect their tissues. They don't want to be eaten. The animals that are getting that energy have to have the adaptations necessary to obtain it. So let's unpack this. First, Dr. Ptolemy mentioned native plants. Native plants are plants that evolved in and are adapted to a local environment. It turns out that most grasses used in our lawns in the United States aren't even native. Even Kentucky bluegrass is European and Asian. It was brought to the United States by European settlers and became popular in Kentucky and thus was given the name Kentucky bluegrass. And non-native plants in general do a terrible job at passing the food they create to the native animals. To explain this, many of you have heard of the food chain, right? That's the concept we're talking about here. You know, grass grows, a cow eats the grass, and then a lion eats the cow. That's the food chain. And actually, a food chain is representative of a poorly functioning system. Most people talk about food chains. It's not really what happens in nature. Rather, we want a food web where lots of animals are eating the plants and lots of other animals are eating those animals that ate the plants. A spider web would be a very good way to, to picture it. But not just one thing eats that plant. A number of things eat it. So picture a number of little lines emanating from that plant. And then a number of things eat those things that ate the plant. And very soon you have a very complicated web of interactions. And in most ecosystems, insects are the primary animals that eat plants and convert their energy to forms that other animals can use. At best, our lawns feed a very small number of animals. And those are often the animals that we consider pests. When we concentrate the preferred food of a particular insect over tens of thousands of acres, of course that insect's going to take advantage of that or do the best they can. Many of the insect pests that people think about are actually introduced species. Lawns are monocultures. We call big concentrations of a single type of plant monocultures. Mono meaning one, and culture in this regard refers to the practice of growing something. So a monoculture is the practice of growing a single item. You might be saying, but Griff, we have hibiscus, camellias, tulips, English ivy, and daylilies all in our yard. That doesn't sound like a monoculture. Dr. Ptolemy has a name for these plants. Gardeners know them as ornamentals. I sometimes think we've become desensitized to that word. These are plants sold for their value as ornaments, or as Dr. Ptolemy says, decorations. These plants are not native to the United States. Not much here eats them, so they're not really contributing to the ecosystem. Plants and animals are fighting an evolutionary arms race. Remember, plants don't want to be eaten. They're protecting their tissues, typically with nasty tasting chemicals. And I'll use the monarch butterfly as a great example here, although it's not an exception. Most of the insects out there are just like the monarch. They can only eat particular plants. In the case of the monarch, it can only eat milkweeds. It is adapted to the cardiac glycosides that milkweeds use to protect their tissue, has behavioral adaptations to getting around the sticky latex sap, that gums up the mouth parts of other insects. So it turns out that these delicate, highly evolved relationships exist everywhere. When you look at the insects that eat plants, 90% of them are what we call specialists, meaning they can only eat particular plants. And that's the problem with specialization. If you take away the plants on which these insects have specialized, you lose the insect. So when we landscape with plants from other countries, None of our insects are specialized on those plants because they've never seen them before. It takes many eons for the insects to adapt to these plants. So we've taken an area the size of New England and we replaced it with plants that don't support our food webs at all. They only serve as decorations. But you still might see some bees or an occasional butterfly on your non-native plants. But don't let that fool you. That's not a relationship. No matter where a plant is from, if it relies on pollination, it's going to attract pollinators to its flowers. So pollinators may do a little window shopping, perhaps even stop for a snack. Think of it like it's a gas station or a convenience store that offers mostly low-quality junk food to adults. And I say adults because it takes thousands of generations of coevolution for insect caterpillars and larvae 
to adapt to being able to eat the leaves of a plant. That's the true mark of a plant contributing to the food web. That is what is meant by a native plant. It's been here long enough to evolve relationships. So why do we have all these lawns and all these ornamental plants in the first place? The idea of lawns used to be a status symbol of the rich. We adopted it from the aristocracy of Europe. In the old days, you could not have lawn if you needed to use that land for agriculture, and most people did. And you needed to maintain it, so you either needed lots of sheep or lots of slaves. And if you had those things, you were rich. Anybody with a big lawn, it was a sign of wealth. Think about the places that have the largest, most manicured lawns. What comes to your mind when you see these neatly trimmed, unbroken expanses of green? I think of opulent mansions, golf courses, corporate headquarters, and luxury resorts. All of these places have money. Yes, it's largely a status symbol. When I was a kid, it was common to compliment our neighbors for a meticulously manicured lawn with no weeds. Or judge them for an unmowed, dying, or weedy lawn. And in many communities, this is still the case. I'm not bashing lawns 100% here. They do have a purpose, especially if you have pets and kids. But surveys show that even then, many people don't actually use their lawns, and we mismanage them. So here's a fun thought experiment. Imagine trying to explain the concept of a lawn to, say, Benjamin Franklin. It might sound like this. Hello, Ben. Thanks for asking about my lawn. It all started when the house was built. We tore up all the existing wild plants and we flattened the ground out. And then we planted thickly with European grass seed. Since that grass doesn't natively grow here, we have to feed it synthetic fertilizer every few months and water it about once a week, sometimes multiple times. And unfortunately, it grows too fast and too long, so we have to cut it with a lawnmower every week. At this point, Ben Franklin is probably thinking we've gone mad, wasting our time and money at a never-ending task. But wait, Ben, there's more. The grass doesn't like our climate much, so we have to apply fungicide a couple times each year to keep those fungal infections from killing it. We have a few pest insects that like to eat the roots of our grass, too. We accidentally brought those from Europe. Oops. But we just applied some insecticides, and um, we do it a couple times a year, and it gets rid of them. Unfortunately, those insecticides kill other organisms, too. You know, bees and stuff. Oh, and we hate weeds. So we apply broadleaf herbicides to kill those, too. Just wait until Ben learns about how those fertilizers, fungicides, and insecticides end up in our waterways all throughout our watersheds many miles away from where we applied them. And it causes havoc, such as harmful algae blooms, amphibian die-offs, and water contamination. Dead zones. Making it worse, many consumers don't even realize they're applying some of these chemicals because they're often mixed in with the fertilizers. It turns out that our obsession with lawns was amplified by some surprising history. So it persists largely at this point through marketing, and the culture is based on neat landscapes, neat open landscapes. Around 1900, we invented the lawnmower. Now we could take care of lawns without having a lot of sheep or a lot of slaves. That made it available to the common man, but it, it represented wealth. In the 50s, marketing took over, and if you didn't have a perfect lawn, you were a communist. Wait, what? Yes. In this post-World War II era, McCarthyism was rampant. It was named for Senator Joseph McCarthy and his extreme efforts to call out and eliminate communists. In this era, fear of communism was pervasive, and accusing someone who didn't conform to your standards as being a communist was commonplace, and it led to many campaigns of false accusations. This is also the era of Levittown, the famous master plan community built by William Levitt. Levitt himself said, no man who owns his own home can be a communist. He has too much to do. And he was referring largely to the upkeep of the property. That's right. Levitt knew that they would be mowing, pruning, raking, spraying, all those things. And keep in mind, there is a $177 billion U.S. lawn care industry, a $31 billion global lawnmower industry, and even the U.S. fertilizer industry is estimated at $3.3 billion. Each of these marketing their quote-unquote solutions in a way that keeps us coming back for more. 
So in a system perpetuated by literally billions of dollars of corporate interest, we're looking at lawns as a sign of personal and community wealth. And much of this was set in motion with a background threat of being labeled as a societal outcast if you didn't comply. Despite all of this, there is a passionate and energized community emerging, looking to bring the mysteries and discoveries of nature to their own homes. And it often starts with observation and curiosity. For years, driving down my street and seeing lawns being sprayed and just the use of chemicals, just after the tracks would leave, I would see birds flying around. And they're, of course, they're going to be landing on those lawns. It just looked wrong. And there's a caution sign on those lawns. This curiosity about the apparent hypocrisy of having a sign telling people to stay off, but seeing birds and squirrels on the lawn led Leslie Inman down a path to learn more. Today, she manages a Facebook group called Pollinator Friendly Yards. How many members are in that group? 184,000, I think. Don't let the pollinator friendly part of the name fool you into thinking the group only cares about pollinators. I reel them in with pollinators and then teach them about, you gotta be thinking about caterpillars and native plants and a lot more. That's 184,000 people sharing stories, ideas, and resources to plant native plants and dispersing that information far beyond the confines of the group. In fact, there are several emerging groups promoting the concept of treating private properties as habitat. Dr. Ptolemy has an organization called Homegrown National Park. We had more than 40 million acres of lawn in this country. And I remember sitting at my kitchen table and I read that and I said, well, what would happen if we cut that area in half? So if everybody took half the area of lawn they had, planted it, how big an area that, would that be? Will that be 20 million acres worth? And I started to add up the area of all the big national parks in the country. And even through in areas like the Adirondacks, not a national park, but it's a big area. So Yellowstone, Yosemite, you know, the Smokies, Denali, all these things, you add them up, still less than 20 million acres. So I said, well, gee, we'd have the biggest national park in the country. We call it Homegrown National Park if everybody cuts their grass can. Homegrown National Park encourages people to plant natives, and over 34,000 people have registered their native plants on the Homegrown National Park map. And the National Wildlife Federation has a long-standing program that encourages people to create a certified wildlife-friendly habitat in their yards. Garden for Wildlife is really the umbrella term for our whole habitat program at National Wildlife Federation, which includes our signature certified wildlife habitat program. And that was launched in 1973. Mary Phillips is the head of National Wildlife Federation's Garden for Wildlife program. And how many people have certified their spaces as habitats? We're at 295,000. So really excited. Hopefully this year in our 50th year, we will hit 300,000. These are all great numbers. And these groups report an acceleration in growth and engagement in their programs. It's a movement that's gaining momentum. In fact, Mary Phillips also reports that some home builders are embracing native plants. Some people are concerned that native plants mean a wild-looking space and wonder how this would fit in with the expectations of their neighbors and homeowners associations. I particularly not wanted it to look crazy and wild because I don't think I'm going to bring people in that way. So especially in the front, it is very calm and tame and easily understood to people who don't understand native plants. It fits in with the other yards, even though it's almost 100% native. So the yard looks intentional, maintained, and aesthetically pleasing. Yes, but a total habitat at the same time. But is a certified habitat as simple as just adding native plants to make your yard wildlife friendly? Mary Phillips from the National Wildlife Federation again. So it's providing wildlife with food, water, cover, and places to raise their young and committing to using sustainable gardening practices. And we actually advocate Native plants being probably the best source of food for wildlife in their various stages of development and specifically try to encourage people to do if they're able in their garden or in their whole yard, 50 to 70 percent native plants. And what about water? If you're within 500 feet or less of a natural water source, that could be counted as well as bird baths or ponds or bubbling fountains. Those kinds of things can be a water source for the requirement. The last part of the NWF recommendation is to have places that provide cover and shelter to raise young. This means leaving leaves and some brush piles and twigs around. Dr. Ptolemy breaks it down like this. 
There are four things that every landscape needs to be doing these days if we're going to reach a sustainable relationship with the ecosystems that support us. Every landscape has to sequester carbon. It's got to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and store it. Every landscape has to support pollinators. 80% of all plants are pollinated by animals and 90% of all flowering plants. So we need pollinators everywhere, not just in agriculture. Every landscape has to support the food web we talked about earlier. And every landscape has to manage the watershed. Lawn wrecks the watershed, particularly with all the things we put on it. They're very short root systems. So when you get a downpour, it doesn't absorb much water and most of it runs off as storm water. Taking the fertilizer and the pesticides and the herbicides that we put on our lawns with it. So this points us back to native plants. They sequester carbon, they support pollinators, they support the food web. And with native plants, you won't need all the pesticides, fertilizers, fungicides, and herbicides that find their way into our water. And once you move away from these monocultures, pest outbreaks should become less and less common. Why is that? By supporting a diversity of native plants, you'll bring balance back to the predator-prey relationships. You'll see more lace wings and ladybugs eating aphids and thrips. You'll see more birds and bats. You'll support hoverflies that pollinate plants as adults and eat aphids as larvae. You'll notice dragonflies, prey mantises, and more. If this all sounds overwhelming, it doesn't have to be. Fortunately, there's a lot of tools out there to make it less complicated. And one of the big things that we encourage is people to just start in a small area of their property. You can even do this on a balcony or a porch. Then you have to pick out the plants that you want. I would also recommend going to public gardens. Public gardens have amazing habitat and native plant display gardens that really could inspire you and give you some ideas and get you some focus. Leslie Inman again. There are six keystone species, which are oak, willow, and prunus cherry. Those are three tree species. And then goldenrod, helianthus sunflower, and aster. And if you could just start with those flowering plants, or if you have room for those trees, those six keystone species can just help the environment and start your habitat immediately. Keystone species are really important, and the ones Leslie mentions are great to start with. Keep in mind that the specific species may vary upon your location. We have some resources to help with that later. Here's Dr. Ptolemy again. Remember the Roman arch? The keystone is the stone in the middle of that arch. And if you take the stone out of the arch, you can just picture the arch collapsing. That's the stone that maintains that arch. So that's why I call these plants keystone species. If you take these species out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. I like to think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that we're building as the two by fours that hold that house up. They're the support system. In the past, we've been decorating with plants trying to build houses out of wallpaper, and that doesn't work. So we want to get those structural plants in there, the ones that are going to support the ecosystem the best, and then we can decorate with other plants later. Remember when we were talking about how native plants do the best job at delivering the energy they create to the food web? Well, these keystone plants do it the very best, and it turns out that one type of plant stands out even among the keystone species. Oak trees do a number of things that make them wonderful plants for your ecosystem. Supporting biodiversity is one of the most important things. First of all, they make acorns, which each acorn is a very rich package of food loaded with fats and proteins. And a single oak tree can make a million acorns in its lifetime. So you've got a, a giant food producer there, for, particularly for mammals and birds. But they also support those caterpillars. So it turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So any plant that supports a lot of species of caterpillars is contributing energy to food webs. And again, nothing supports caterpillars as well as oaks. Oaks are incredibly resilient, and there are 91 species of oak trees that grow in different sizes, including dwarf varieties and species that simply stay small. And Mary Phillips agrees on this concept. Hey, nature enthusiast, do you want to be part of something bigger? Well, we're building a movement at Jumpstart Nature, and we've just added some new volunteers to help with our podcast and website. But this means our costs are going up too. I need to purchase software licenses to give them access to the production tools we use. For example, one media editing license costs $21 a month. And this is where you come in. Please consider supporting our mission by contributing to Jumpstart Nature through our Patreon or direct contributions, or even purchasing some logo merch. Check out all these options at jumpstartnature.com slash donate, also linked in the show notes. Not ready to make a financial contribution? 
then please share this episode with three friends. Sharing what we do is actually one of the very best ways you can help us. Thank you all for your continued support. If you have the space to add shrubs and trees, a lot of times people are like, I'm just going to do a flowering perennial garden, which is great. But to add those shrubs and trees, because they're the big super plants. There are a few other key points. Be sure to understand the water requirements of your plants. And when you buy your plants, make sure they aren't treated with pesticides. Many growers pre-treat plants and even seeds with pesticides such as neonicotinoids that can persist for years and even leach into neighboring plants. If your garden center can't definitively answer that the plants they are selling are pesticide-free, then they probably aren't. Also, in the fall, you don't have to rake up all the leaves. Leave as much as you can in place because many important insects overwinter in leaf litter. When you blow leaves in the pile and put them all in bags, you are sending your moths, fireflies, and other insects away from your yard and probably to their death. Leslie suggests leaving the leaves in the fall is something so simple. Just break it off your little and put it under your bushes. Birds thrash through those and look for insects and helps the fireflies. Also, turning off the lights is huge. You know, so easy. Don't string your whole backyard with lights. With I know that's pretty and you can use it when you have a party, but to leave those on every night. It's very disruptive. In the same way that millions of lawns become destructive, so do millions of lights. Certain wavelengths of light are particularly attractive to insects and disrupt their navigation. These insects can literally get stuck, transfixed, unable to tear away from that light. They flutter around it and around it all night and die of exhaustion. In this way, we are harvesting countless insects every summer night. Motion sensors or even yellow wavelength lights that are designed to not attract bugs are great alternatives. And what if you add a bird feeder to improve your yard habitat? Well, you might be surprised that this isn't such a straightforward thing. In fact, we decided to devote an entire episode to the subject. Tune in next week. In the meantime, we want to make planting native plants easy for you. This is perhaps the most convenient thing that you can do to make a difference for nature. And it's entertaining. Gardening is interesting. Remember, you can also do this at your place of worship, your school, or place of business. Why not build community and start a native garden? A native garden can be a great addition to a food garden since it will support pollinators and predators that can restore balance and help you kick that insecticide habit. One of the best places to go to get started is on the National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder website. You can simply plug in your zip code and it will show you what is native to your very neighborhood. The NWF even sells some of those plants. And many of our guests recommend finding native plant cells at arboretums and botanical gardens near you. And most states have native plant societies that often have cells and seed exchanges and can support you in other ways. And once you get native plants, or if you already have some, don't forget to celebrate your achievement by logging it on the Homegrown National Park Biodiversity Map at map dot homegrown national park dot org be sure to check out the show notes for all of these resources and more at jumpstartnature.com slash podcast and we also have in-depth interviews with dr ptolemy and leslie inman on our sister podcast nature's archive so go shrink your lawn add some native plants and start your journey to help wildlife and our planet and have you already reduced your lawn and added native plants tell us your story You can email us at podcast at jumpstartnature.com or simply reply to our social media post about this episode. We're at Jumpstart Nature on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks to all of our guests today, including Leslie Inman, Mary Phillips, and Dr. Doug Tallamy. Jumpstart Nature was created and produced by me, Michael Hawk. Michelle Balderston is our associate producer, and our host is Griff Griffith. Some of the music used in this production is done so with permission via Creative Commons licenses. This includes the following songs, Port of Geese by Alexander Nakarada, Sunny Morning by Music L Files. Both songs are available from filmmusic.io, and full license information is in the show notes at jumpstartnature.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.
If we went back in time to say 1777 to a place called Grifftown, Pennsylvania, it would probably be normal to hear people complaining about getting passenger pigeon poop in their hair. This bird, once the most numerous in North America, went extinct in the wild by 1900. In 1877, it would be normal to hear someone say that the salmon were so thick in California's rivers that you could walk across their backs to the other side. Today, salmon species are listed as endangered or threatened in much of their range. In 1977, it would be normal for my dad to thoroughly wash the smashed insects off our windshield every time we stopped for gas. He had to do this or he wouldn't be able to see. Today, I live and drive in the same places, but I rarely need to take a squeegee to my windshield. The insects just aren't there. These extreme examples of wildlife population declines happened in just a few generations, and despite being obvious in hindsight, weren't always obvious while they were happening. And even today, there are many other examples occurring right in front of us that most people are completely unaware of. This misperception can be attributed to a particular quirk of human psychology called shifting baseline syndrome. This quirk has to do with how you and I perceive normal from a particular place and time. For example, what do you consider to be normal weather? How many birds in our parks is normal? What species of trees are normal in our forest? The idea of normal depends on who is doing the observing and when they are doing it. Historical marine ecologist Lauren McClanahan unearthed an incredible reference that vividly illustrates this phenomenon at work. I was focused on the Florida Keys and the Caribbean trying to see what sorts of sources existed. And it was actually the very last archive that I was visiting in, in Key West, the Monroe County Public Library. I was working with the archivist, basically saying, I'm interested in anything that can tell us about long-term change. And then he came out one morning with this big box of pictures. And there were these pictures of people just come back from recreational fishing trips in the 1950s and 1960s. And there was just these immense, immense fish in the, in the photographs. And immediately it was like a giant light bulb <laughs> went off. So I was in Key West and I went and took repeat photos in the same sort of vein and, and then compared them. These photos were taken at the same spot after similar deep sea fishing trips. And what did she find? I found a 90% decline in the size of these large trophy fish over that 50 year time period. Essentially, we've replaced these large trophy fish that we think of as, as being these massive catches and these massive fish on the reef with really small fish that have essentially replaced the fish both in the ecosystem and then also in the fishery itself. Yes, these fishers returned with fish that were 90% smaller than just a few decades ago, but they had the same big smiles and looks of satisfaction in their photos as the fishermen of the past who had the much larger fish. Yeah, exactly. That's the, and that's the shifting baseline syndrome. They seemingly had no idea that just a few decades ago, they could have been catching fish 90% larger. Things had changed just slowly enough that the fishers didn't think about it at the moment because they didn't have the same baseline of normal. But shifting baseline syndrome is so much deeper than just our perceptions. We know historically that it only takes one generation to forget. It only takes one generation to be killed off, displaced, or denied access to an area for them to forget the culture. That was Francisco Antonio Saavedra Jr., a member of Pitt River Tribe, Medeci Band, with Yurok ancestry. We're going to hear more from him shortly. So let's take a deeper look at our sense of normal, shifting baseline syndrome, and what it means to you, me, indigenous people, and how we treat the environment. I'm Griff Griffith, and welcome to Jumpstart Nature. A moment ago, we got a small taste of shifting baseline syndrome, and we'll come back to Dr. McClanahan's findings in a bit. But first, just what is shifting baseline syndrome? Shifting baseline syndrome is this idea that the first time that you observe an environment, you, you think of it as natural and all changes that you observe after that personally, you think of as not natural. So you can imagine you know, your childhood environment, the neighborhood that you grew up in. Right? Who hasn't had the experience of returning to a place they know well after several years and seeing everything has changed? What you grew up with is your baseline of normal. And now, the next generation is growing up with a new baseline of normal. If they're lucky, they'll hear stories about the way it used to be 
but that will never feel normal to them. But is the way it used to be the way it should be in the future? What really comes out of that is that our ecosystems are not static. They were not and should not be thought of as static. That's often a challenging thing when we want to do like conservation work or restoration where we're like, we're getting credit to do X, Y, or Z, and we, we want it to stay that way. That's Dr. Allison Whipple of the San Francisco Estuary Institute, referring to a study on the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta in California. In the system, river channels, islands, and sloughs were constantly changing due to floods, droughts, and other environmental processes. If we look at any ecosystem, we see frequent change. In fact, there is an important concept where one ecosystem tends to convert to another ecosystem over time. Ecologists call this succession. A great example is a mountain meadow. Picture this meadow. It probably has short grasses and sedges, perhaps even a few hardy wildflowers. And it's often surrounded by forest. This meadow formed because of some dramatic geologic event, such as a glacier scraping out all the topsoil and plants and leaving behind poor, rocky soil. Grasses and sedges can live in that environment, but not much else. Over time, those sedges and grasses grow and die and decompose, adding nutrients to the soil. Fungi and bacteria move in, and new pioneer plants start to encroach around the edges of the meadow. The soil continues to improve, allowing shrubs and small trees to move in, and accelerating the soil building. Eventually, the large trees move in, and the meadow is gone. Most ecosystems have these types of natural pressures, to transition to some different system similar to what we just described with meadows. That is, unless something dramatic happens. Many ecosystems have natural reset buttons, such as wildfire. These reset buttons prevent succession or perhaps even roll back the system to an earlier stage. In fact, we're gonna go deep into wildfire in a future episode, but for now, Know that our obsession with wildfire suppression has allowed succession to continue without reset in many places where it wouldn't have been possible in the past. Ben Goldfarb, author of Crossings and Eager, has also been thinking about shifting baseline syndrome. It's a concept developed in fisheries where maybe your grandfather, you know, would catch these giant groupers and then he fished out those groupers and then you know then and then your father would catch smaller groupers but we think it's still fine and today you're catching sardines but you know you don't really know any better because you weren't alive when your grandfather was catching giant groupers and you know and someday your children will be eating jellyfish but you know that's okay because they have no memory of what the oceans were like during their kind of apex abundance Ben's example of eating jellyfish might seem a bit extreme but it powerfully drives home the point often these shifting baselines cause our expectations of nature's abundance and productivity to decline. And this can create a destructive feedback loop. Let's consider a hypothetical new development project. Perhaps a new strip mall is being proposed for some area of land. The developers and politicians, and probably most people, assess the impact of the project based on current conditions. What does this land do for us today? Perhaps that land is abandoned agricultural land. It's not providing much ecological value, so officials decide to approve the strip mall. But our baseline of the land is totally wrong. Perhaps that spot back in 1900 was a wetland that helped buffer floods and supported fish, frogs, bats, and a generally abundant ecosystem, and could easily be restored. But our baseline tells us otherwise. So the decision to build on the land didn't fully consider the ecological potential of the area. Our acceptance of these new baselines is extremely damaging, but shifting baselines run deeper still. One example that I alluded to earlier was the Goliath grouper in the Florida Keys. And so this is a fish that has existed in great abundances for, for centuries. It was fished intensively over the last century, and it was protected in the 1990s because of a realization that it was, it was really depleted. And since then, it started to come back, which is great. But people who have recently moved to the Keys, for example, will say things like, there's more now than I've ever seen in my lifetime, which is true, but it's also just part of the story. And so in the absence of a longer term perspective, those voices really dominate the, the narrative. In the case of the Goliath grouper, there's been pressure to reopen the fishery essentially every year since it was closed in the 1990s. And it just was successful in this last year, which I think is unfortunate. I think partially that's a result of sort of sense that, you know, things are 
things are better than they were <laughs> in terms of the populations and these, these fish that people were used to as seeing rarely in these ecosystems are coming back. This rebound effect is also common. Without a proper baseline, we tend to mistakenly perceive a partial recovery as a much more significant improvement. And at this point, I feel like I just need to give the ocean a shout out. You probably know that nearly 70% of our planet is covered in oceans. You might also know that oceans play the most prominent role in our climate, where ocean temperatures and currents influence major weather patterns and trends. It's easy for us to see what's happening on land, which plants and animals are growing, how much land is used for people and agriculture, but only a tiny fraction of us spend any real time on our oceans. We don't have the same intuitions about how they work and what they support. To help wrap our minds around this, people often cite that 70% statistic, but it goes so much deeper, literally. Susan Casey, author of The Underworld, Journeys to the Depths of the Ocean, says if we think of the parts of the earth that support life, 98% is ocean. That's because life in the ocean generally occurs all throughout its depths. Above sea, life is restricted to a thin slice close to the Earth's surface. Despite the importance of oceans, we seem to have a lot of problems with shifting baselines in marine systems. Humans are terrestrial animals. I think we just have a much shorter set of observations under the ocean than we do in terrestrial systems. And so in marine systems, we developed scuba and the ability to essentially be aquatic animals for short periods of time in the 1960s and 1970s. And so scientists began to use those and study those systems a few decades ago. And so we have observations coming out of that history of, of marine science, but the average person doesn't spend a lot of time underwater. And so I think there's just a lot less sort of knowledge about the changes that have happened. It's frightening to think how much has changed in our oceans in such a short period and our general lack of knowledge going back further in time. But historical ecologists like Dr. McClanahan find creative ways to uncover the past. So I worked with some early pirate journals and descriptions of travels through the Caribbean, which is really fun. There was this one pirate named William Dampier, who was just an amazing natural historian. He recorded the different species of mangroves, and he was really interested in turtles, which is how I came across him. But his narrative of his voyages and his trip around the world really includes a whole lot of ecology, actually, which is sort of surprising. And this makes sense. Making a living at sea, regardless of the ethics of that living, requires a deep understanding of the ocean and its animals. A pirate in the 1600s would be totally dependent on the oceans for food, travel, and just general survival. If you weren't a skilled observer taking detailed notes, you probably wouldn't survive long. <laughs> Back to land for a few minutes. Dr. Allison Whipple and her colleagues at the San Francisco Estuary Institute have spent significant time establishing an early to mid-1800s baseline of two parts of California. Let's first look at the San Joaquin-Sacramento River Delta. This is just downstream from the famous 49er gold discoveries. This is a very unique system. We don't have a lot of inland deltas in the world. So this was a, historically a freshwater but tidal system. So we had the, the two rivers in the Central Valley, the Sacramento in the north and the San Joaquin in the south, coming through the Central Valley, draining the Sierra Nevada and other the western coastal systems and coalescing into pretty crazy mess of tidal channels in the Delta. We mapped over 360,000 acres of tidal freshwater wetland in the Delta. There's a ton of interesting geology here, but I'll keep it to the basics. As Dr. Whipple said, the Sierra Nevada mountains act like a blockade on storms and force a lot of rain and snow out. All this water flows downhill, seeking the ocean, but it runs into another mountain range. Thankfully for the water, there is a narrow opening in the mountains near San Francisco. Both rivers converge at this point, forming the massive delta. Okay, that's a lot of words. We'll put a map in the show notes. But just recognize that we have a lot of water trying to go through a narrow area. So it creates this huge delta into California's Central Valley. In the 1800s, this delta was enormous, biodiverse, and very productive. Contrast that to today, where we've really done a lot in terms of hemming in those tidal channels, basically levying off the small dendritic channels that used to weave within the tidal wetlands and quote unquote, reclaiming that land for agriculture. Those peat soils are very rich for crops. 
And so they've been great for many decades now. And so we're really, yeah, that's that big contrast shifting to an agricultural landscape. So we've seen what we documented in, in our mapping was about a 97% loss of the tidal freshwater wetlands. So we really have only very small patches today. Today's Central Valley is perhaps the most productive agricultural land in the United States, full of almonds, walnuts, citrus, tomatoes, grapes, garlic, and dozens of other crops. So what's the downside of channeling the Delta and creating more farmland? Well, with intensive agriculture, the fertility of these existing soils are declining, and we're no longer generating as much new fertile soil. Of course, there is also the loss of many ecosystems and biodiversity and negative impacts to fisheries. Without insights to the early 1800s baseline, we'd be inclined to continue to rain in the river delta and expose more productive soils. But understanding how the system worked in the past and what created this fertile land in the first place gives us the knowledge to make better decisions. We don't necessarily suffer from shifting baseline syndrome in the same way. We know that we were stewards of the land. We know that the land's been altered. We, we know the history. It has been passed down orally, mostly. My name is Francisco Antonio Saavedra Jr. My Yurok name is Shpigi, C-H-P-G-I. It means osprey in Yurok. We briefly heard from Francisco earlier. He studies tribal forestry at the College of the Redwoods in Eureka, California. He's also a forestry apprentice in one of the largest restoration projects in the United States. It's called Redwood Rising, and it's happening on the Yurok people's homeland. The Yurok people reside in far northern California. While the Yurok tribal lands today overlap with their ancestral lands, they have been reduced from roughly 1 million acres down to about 56,000 acres. We've been stewards for the land of, for over 10,000 years. And sometimes that's some of the disconnect that I see with the loss of like species like the salmon. You know, we've experienced dramatic environmental changes and decline of species, the staple foods. One of the staples of the Yurok is the lamprey eel or Pacific lamprey, as some call it. The amount of eels that my grandfather used to catch in the 50s and the 60s was in the hundreds. It was a lot. A guys could go out there and catch hundreds of eels to the point where they're taking turns catching eels. And it was sustainable because at that time, lamprey eels made up 90% of the river's biomass. That's something that when I tell people that, when I say, hey, did you know that lamprey eels made up 90% of the river's biomass as far down as the Sacramento River? Think of all those indigenous nations who've maybe never even seen a lamprey eel because of hydroelectric damming, because of redirection of water, because of loss of streams and habitat through commercial logging. It's estimated that the lamprey eel have decreased by 90% since the 1960s. A couple of things stand out here. One, remember that number, 90%. And two, this demonstrates how complicated shifting baselines are. Francisco clearly knows the history. He knows the baseline. But many others, even some conservationists, may not know this. And part of that reason is not only because of shifting baselines, colonists. Created hydroelectric dams and classified the lamprey as a parasitic fish. He didn't make no fish ladder for them. He only made it for the salmon. The lamprey died off in massive, massive numbers. Yes, Western cultures love to label everything. In this case, the lamprey eel was labeled a parasite. That label alone is filled with negative connotations, reducing the chances that anyone would try to save this fish. But who are we to judge the strategies that life has evolved to embrace? And we actually need creatures like lamprey eels to maintain balance in our ecosystems. But the view of shifting baselines from an indigenous perspective runs much deeper. We know historically that it only takes one generation to forget. It only takes one generation to be killed off, displaced, or denied Access to an area for them to forget the culture. California indigenous people are reclaiming their culture and lands. And the real story of what happened to them is starting to become more clear. I know when I was in school, we weren't taught about the systemic genocide of Native Americans in California and other parts of the USA. Yes, I know the term genocide has taken on different legal and common meanings, but it's hard to ignore the intent of policies and the reality of actions that were taken 
very often violent actions. Thousands of Native Americans were killed directly through massacres or forced starvation. Many thousands more were separated from their families, enslaved, or put in very oppressive boarding schools. In fact, there were land grants and related policies that encouraged colonists to clear the land, removing numerous oak trees from the landscape. These were oak trees that the indigenous people depended on for food and other things. As we learned in episode one, oak trees are also the champion species of biodiversity. Stick with me here. Have you ever heard of Silicon Valley? It's the part of California where silicon-based microchips, computer processors, were developed and mass-produced. It's now known for its tech culture. Depending on how you define its boundaries, it's home to four to six million people. You look around today and you see business centers, office parks, and suburban sprawl. But this area used to support exceptional varieties and quantities of plants and animals. In the Santa Clara Valley, certainly as you head north and head towards the bay, you start entering into more of a seasonal wetland complexes, alkali seasonal wetland, and then moving into, once you hit tidal influence, the tidal marshes of the bay historically. Santa Clara Valley is the proper geographic region that is known as Silicon Valley. Wetlands and tidal marshes are some of the most productive ecosystems, most of which have been filled, channelized, or entirely cut off. But this area was also home to many, many oak trees, especially further south. Again, really a really profound and dramatic loss of oaks in that period of mid-1800s to that early 1930s period based on reconstructing using methods to take the trees that were documented in those GLO notes, those general land office notes, and then extrapolate out what that would have meant in terms of numbers of trees based on the densities that we'd estimated. And so we found that there was probably around 50 trees per hectare, or that's 20 trees per acre, which can be roughly approximated to about 20 trees in a football field, if that's something folks can imagine. This research was in a narrow area of the south part of Santa Clara Valley. Sources that we are able to use for the work is mostly generated by those who occupied California in the early 1800s. So the Spanish explorers, the missionaries, the 49ers, etc. It revealed the loss of basically 50,000 of the most important trees we have for biodiversity. I think it's safe to say that most of the businesses and homeowners in that area have no idea what was lost. And this is why we're such advocates for planting native plants at home at school, at your place of worship or place of business. And if you're listening, say, in Ohio, Florida, Texas, New York, or pretty much anywhere else, the story is the same. Just change the name of the species. 50,000 oak trees down to 300 is roughly a 99% reduction. Can you recall earlier when I said, remember the 90% reduction? Here's Dr. McClanahan again. That work found a 90% decline in the size of the largest fish that were caught in the Florida Keys, there was work from, from Maine, from this part of the world, that showed a 90% or more decline in the abundance of cod on the Scotian Shelf since the, the Civil War. One of the early uh, papers in this field showed a 90% loss of pelagic fish like billfish and tuna caught on Japanese long pit, longline fisheries since the 1950s. So it, I think it's, it's really sort of stunning that across these different geographies and timescales and species and ways of measuring, it's a really consistent finding, which is this 90% or order of magnitude loss. There's a Canadian journalist who I think put it really nicely in saying that we live in a 10% world. So the world that we're living in now has, in various ways that you look at it, 10% of the abundance and the biomass and the productivity that it had you know, when you look farther in the past. In many ways, we now live in a 10% world. Can you imagine the beauty, awe, and wonder of a 100% world? So what can you do to help? Our earlier episode, The Yard of the Future, gave you one of the most powerful things that you can do, and that's plant native plants wherever you can. And jumpstartnature.com has a special downloadable PDF called Everyone's Guide to Helping Our Planet, which has over 100 simple steps that you can take. You don't have to be overwhelmed, but you should get started. Today, we've heard how shifting baseline syndrome skews our perception of the world, causing us to miss dramatic changes altogether, misinterpret typical processes such as succession, diminish and gloss over injustices, and overestimate small rebounds in populations. What are some examples of shifting baseline syndrome that you've seen? We'd love to hear from you and we're curious. You can email us at podcast at jumpstartnature.com or leave a comment on one of our social media pages. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Jumpstart Nature. 
A big thanks to Lauren McClanahan, Francisco Saavedra Jr., Ben Goldfarb, and Allison Whipple. Allison Whipple also wants us to acknowledge the historical ecology team at San Francisco Estuary Institute that's currently led by Sean Baumgarten and was founded by Robin Grossinger. If you want more Shifting Baselines, Nature's Archive has a full-length interview with Lauren McClanahan. It's episode number 78. And jumpstartnature.com slash podcast has a transcript and full show notes for today's episode, including links to topics we mentioned and additional resources to help you learn more about Shifting Baseline Syndrome. Jumpstart Nature was created and produced by me, Michael Hawk. Michelle Balderston is our associate producer, and our host is Griff Griffith. The song Lo-Fi Prairie by Brian Holtz Music was used in this production with permission via Creative Commons license. The song is available from filmmusic.io, and the full license information is in the show notes at jumpstartnature.com slash podcast. As always, thanks for listening. Thanks for sticking through the entire episode. If you made it this far, I hope that it means that you enjoyed it. If so, please spread the word and share this episode with three friends or groups that you think would enjoy it too. As for today's episode, let me know. Did I miss anything? Was there a topic I should have covered? Let me know at podcast at jumpstartnature.com or DM me on any of my social accounts. I'll do my best to answer your questions. You can find me at Nature's Archive, one word, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I also share photography, nature stories, and much more on those accounts, so you can follow just to stay in touch, too. And despite being called crazy by numerous friends and colleagues, last year I left my tech career behind to start Jumpstart Nature, which Nature's Archive is now part of. For the sake of myself, my family, and the planet, I need to make this work, so please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash jumpstartnature. I offer some exclusive content and perks, and you can start donations as low as $4 a month. Lastly, please also check out our latest creation. It's the Jumpstart Nature podcast. We just completed our pilot season where each episode reveals an unseen, surprising, or misunderstood nature topic with the help of experts and our host, Griff Griffith. It's entertaining and inspiring and even reached number three on the Apple Nature podcast charts. There's much more on our roadmap, but we need your support. So check out jumpstartnature.com for more details. Thank you. Thank you.